How's it hanging? HCRG here! Good of everyone to tune in. And if I got something special prepared for everyone this week, it's a Dinosaurus line! First off, we got our own King of the Monsters, straight out of Japan, who's been taking the world by storm after raging storm after raging storm for well over half a century. To be exact, it's been about 60 years. So let's dive right in. Godzilla, Monster of Monsters, released in 1988. Developed by Compile of Gunak, Zanak, Alesti, aka Space Megaforce and Power Strike, as well as Puyo Puyo, aka Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine and Kirby's Avalanche fame, on behalf of Toho's Cinephile Soft Library Division, you take control of the Big Green Lizard and his roving right hand Robolosser or Mothra as they battle either their separate and or fused ways through each interplanetary field and leveling up in between. Sure, most of the Godzilla games I'm about to discuss, this one included, aren't up to snuff in terms of their initial concept. Think of Warner Brothers or Midway's Rampage, or SNK Playmore's King of the Monster series, but they're still unique on their own Steam. If you've bothered to read the two minute long intro, like I did somehow, the basic storyline takes place in the year 2 XXX AD, and Planet X has declared war on the Earth. And you know what the hell that means. Shit just got real, dude. Now it's up to the combined efforts of both Godzilla and Mothra to put an end to the invader's ruthless ambition before all existence and creation as we know it comes to a fucking end. Following the opening story intro, the game introduces us to a strategic chessboard on which Godzilla and Mothra are standing, opposite the faraway bosses. Those include, but aren't limited to, and take note, those are the most frequent bosses throughout the entire game. Gazora and Mogera, both of which appeared first in their original respective Toho films, Space Amoeba, released in 1970, and The Mysterians, otherwise known as Earth Defense Force, Chikyu Boegun, released in 1957, and didn't even see the light of day in any Godzilla-related media until way after this game. Depending on which character you pick, Godzilla and Mothra each have their own respective statistics, as well as the ability to move along each set of hexagon spaces. Either one or two for Godzilla, depending on which region you're playing. And four spaces for Mothra, while in the Japanese version she can only move half that, in said case two. After moving set amounts of spaces, the game switches to a series of side-scrolling battle zone scenarios. Its settings include, but aren't limited to, the planetary wilderness areas, the volcanic areas, one of three different subspaces, some of which are inhabited by bio-organic life, or a huge-ass attack ship, which the Kaiju Guardian must take out. As well as jungles, ruins, and mechanical urban areas, within which your desired monster kicks serious ass. After clearing said series, depending on how many spaces both monsters have plotted beforehand, they must both make their way to the Planetary Base HQ in order to teleport to the next strategic planetary field. Concerning Godzilla's abilities, he can walk, jump, use up on the D-pad, as well as punch and kick, A and B respectively, perform a tail whip, just use B while crouching, and fire off his trademark atomic breath, which dramatically uses up a mind-blowing amount of power. Just push start, select just pauses the game. Turtles 4 Turtles in Time Much? The common downside with Godzilla, if more than just one, is that he moves at approximately, if half, a crab's pace, and his speed and mobility is affected by the terrain in which he migrates. As for Mothra, my best bet was that she was just added within the game for shits and gigs, despite her obviously low and unreliable capabilities. She can fly over various obstacles, use her weak as hell eye beam, A and or B, as well as rain down on her adversaries and obstacles with her powder thus shedding her wings, which, again, uses up an amount of power, except it's a decent amount this time. The common downsides with her are that none of her offenses pack enough firepower, and that she takes damage way too easily from projectiles and enemies. The only difference, aside from their abilities, is that Mothra's energy and attack power levels are slightly higher than Godzilla's from the get-go. For power-ups, there's two types of cells both of the Kaiju Guardians can use the most frequent of which are life cells, acquired simply by taking out certain enemies and obstacles, in order to regenerate their life energy. 
As for the Kaiju's power levels, aside from allowing them to regenerate their own power over time, like in Target Earth, aka Assault Suits Lanos, the power cells can be found, if in a few rare blue moons, to do the exact same thing. The controls, to say the absolute least, are rather adequate for a Godzilla game, despite the character's ability flaws I've pointed out earlier. Sure, they might be out of whack at first, well, in Mothra's case at least, but after a few test drives, it should definitely be all smooth sailing from here. Now getting back to the bosses, again the most frequent of them are the aforementioned Gazora and Mogera, and both of them have their own set of techniques that will definitely keep the Kaiju Guardians in hot water. Other bosses that appear in later planetary fields include Varan from his own Toho film, released back in 58. Hedera the Smog Monster from Godzilla vs. Hedera, released in 71. Baragon from Frankenstein Conquers the World, released back in 65. Not to mention Gigan, Mega Godzilla, and finally, King Fucking Ghidorah! If you defeat any of them, either Godzilla or Mothra gains a level, if not every time. Now getting to the challenge, and yes, we're still on the topic of bosses, each time you progress, they get tougher and tougher and tougher. Now take note, whenever you face a boss, there's an imaginary time limit. If the battle drags on for way too long, you have to continue fighting it from the get-go, even as that enemy monster regenerates its health over time. In addition, in each battle zone, both Godzilla and Mothra really have to watch their asses at all times, especially with all of those unexpected traps, attack ships, structures, and apparitions, because if both of them get snuffed, it's an instant game over. The only exception being is that if one Kaiju Guardian survives the remainder of the planetary field war unscathed. Easy as they are to decipher from start to finish, the overall graphical presentation is nothing short of tasteful for the NES era. And don't even get me started on most of the detailed monsters and objects. It's exactly like destroy all monsters all over again. On one hand, they might be a pain in the ass to map out, especially the bio enemies in the subspace stage, including the Matango organisms, aka the Mushroom People, from, well, obviously, Attack of the Mushroom People, and the like. But they're all distinguishable enough and pleasing to the eye, even after a quarter of a century. Concerning Godzilla's music, it's well composed and up to par to say Capcom standards. And must I mention that each musical piece offers us with its own air variety? Considering most of the pieces aren't in any way identical to any Godzilla lore, except of course for the title screen theme, which is also used as the final field in the game, and can sound rather abrasive at times, they've pretty much held their own during the NES era. I, in full honesty, can't say for certain how much chance of replayability this game possesses, but aside from the password system, the chances of anyone desiring to dive back into this game after a super long hiatus are about as slim as a single hairpiece. Then again, who could resist the tempting excitement of intergalactic monster-on-monster slash alien armada action? My only word of advice is to plan out and put your strategic operations into action, but most importantly, they must be done in a deliberate poise, even if it means getting your ass snuffed and annihilated. Exhibit B, Godzilla on Game Boy, released two years later. The basic plotline is that Minia, Godzilla's son, if you've seen any of the films in which he's had a part, has been kidnapped by his adversaries. Therefore, it's up to our old King of the Monsters, in chibi form of course, to embark on a quest through the Great Matrix Labyrinth, while solving its complex-ass puzzles and mazes and fending off those terror-inducing sons of bitches like he means business. With a metallic boxing glove? What the fuck? Basically, the concept is to have Godzilla crush most of the rocks contained within every Matrix Labyrinth maze while fending off his enemies. Baragon, Mechagodzilla, Hedera, Angerus, and Rodan. Using his, well, trusty metallic boxing glove, as well as climbing up vines, minus jumping and using his atomic breath here, of course, and collecting necessary aiding items, few of which include an hourglass to stop time, kinda like in Castlevania, a Thunderbolt Crusher nuke that rids the entire maze of every damn enemy in sight, like in Contra, as well as a Heart for Life refills, well, obviously, not to mention it also awards you an extra life. With the exception of every regular enemy, it'll take way more than just Godzilla's glove to waste Hedera. In fact, you need another rock in order to accomplish just that. 
After breaking down most of the rocks in the stage, you get to pick one of two possible paths, if rarely just one, leading to the next room, which happens at the end of every stage. But here's yet another important tip. If you take too long to clear any stage, King Ghidorah will fly in and send your ass into oblivion. While Start simply pauses as the music's still playing, Select brings up a menu with four choices. Continue, try again, starting a stage from scratch simply by committing suicide. The entire plan, which presents a layout of the entire labyrinth, no matter how far you've gotten. Hell, even if you started from a random room, not just from the beginning. And finally, your password, which generates two types of them. One with four digits, another with 18, composed of letters, numbers, and symbols. Kinda like in Gargoyle's Quest, which was at the same time. Concerning the game's challenge, despite being different from the NES version, this entry has its own share variety in terms of the level selection and layout, thus dramatically raising the difficulty level off the charts as our own chibi King of the Monsters progresses throughout each stage. Therefore, most G fans won't get tired of this one, oh fuck no. Simplistic as the graphics are, they're actually not half bad. Although most of the monsters are cheapified, which is part of the game's charm. I mean, go figure, it's from Japan anyway. The detailed photorealistic renditions stand out even more, as do the stage layouts. In terms of music and sound, aside from the menacing intro score at the title screen, everything else from the opening cast demo to the majority of the in-game tracks, they all turn out to be nothing more than campy and upbeat. Sure, it might seem cheesy and dull at first, or after a while, but it's actually a blessing to hear it all. Same story with the sound effects. Limited as the replayability is, once you figure out the proximities and strategies for each maze stage, mastering the entire game should be nothing more than a milk run, mostly because they all wind up being the same in the end. Well, the stages, that is, no matter how often you play it. Next up we've got Godzilla 2 War of the Monsters, and man is it the worst of the bunch. In this one you play as the military, as opposed to the title character. What the shit, Toho? Upon the appearance of their current enemy, specifically our old King of the Monsters, the ragtag battalions of the Japanese Allied Defense Forces prepare for their most epic struggle yet, to defend their beloved country from his great offenses. And onto the basic gameplay and controls. After picking a desired scenario, we get introduced to a war strategy game setup featuring not only Godzilla and or other monsters, but most of the Japanese artillery units opposing them. Say, 10 to 20 attack planes and tanks, tops. Basically, all you do is direct most of your army towards some of the monsters, one series of turns at a time, like in the last Godzilla NES game, in this case, 99 turns, which is the overall time limit, and confronting them in battle, in the styles of Victokai's conflict series, not to mention Koei's entire library of simulators, Nobunaga's Ambition, Romance of the Three Kingdoms, PTO, Bandit Kings of Ancient China, Gemfire, Uncharted Waters, Liberty or Death, Kessin, The Works, as well as Banpresto's Super Robot Taisen series, and the like. Upon switching to battle mode, there's an entire RPG-style turn-based battle going on between your unit and a certain monster. Whenever your unit initiates an attack, a slot machine starts spinning out of control. Why, why World or Sonic too much? Thus prompting you to stop all three slot units, all of which include four possible power enhancement icons. One for offense, one for defense, another for hit percentage, and for either one of the three outcomes picked at random, hence the JP icon. These icons are also represented depending on the color. Blue for the allied defense forces, and red for the enemies. If all three of the same icons are displayed regardless of color, all three outcomes will be bestowed upon you for the battle. Other times, the monster will have the upper hand against you depending on your strategy. And I know what we're all thinking here. Yawn, right? So should you decide to tolerate what the second-rate real-time strategy follow-up has to offer, or hell, attempt to pick it up for even the insanely high prices this game goes for nowadays? Some additional tips to bear in mind. You should rely on the labs often in order to have even the most advanced weapons and units applied. Protect the bridges from being wrecked. Keep most of your best units near army bases and or air bases should the need arise for mid-battle repairs. Initiate a sneak attack on any isolated enemies rather than battle any close pairs of them. And once again, take note, the scenarios are timed, so consider a very high chance of failure if you don't finish the stage in time. 
And most importantly, don't even think about deploying that goddamn atomic bomb because it'll end the game instantaneously, thus fucking you so goddamn hard in the ass, you won't be able to sit or shit for almost a month. The random equipment modifications for each later scenario pretty much adds to the challenge, not to mention the nerve-wracking advanced difficulty level. And don't even get me started on the below average gel AI of the game, as well as the addition of more not to be fucked with monsters who will make a half ruined Stonehenge out of your whole motherfucking army. The graphics are a total eyesore, even for the NES. It makes Robocop 2 by Data East and Ocean look like Shatterhand. Despite Toho's efforts in making most of the military units and monsters stand out, everything else is far from remarkable. Trap colored cutscenes and maps. Shit, must I go on any further? The music, with due respect, is annoying as all hell. You can even disable the music during the scenarios, which in turn deactivates the fucking sound effects. Sure, you've heard this from every other reviewer out there. Well, it's my turn now. You're better off muting the Christ damn TV! And don't even get me started on the replayability, because there's absolutely little to zilch whatsoever, no matter what your intentions are. Just don't even waste your time with this abomination. You're better off with Koei's games instead. My best recommendation is Nobunaga's Ambition. Final exhibit, Super Godzilla, released two years later for the SNES. So the story takes place in 1990X, Clash at Demon Head Anyone? And a message from an unknown source has been announced, revolving around a general attack on most of Japan. Thus, King Ghidorah starts all kinds of crap, ripping Osaka to shreds. Therefore, the country's own self-defense agency resurrects Godzilla from the nearby sea, implanting him with an operation box devised by Professor Ogata, with the ability to be controlled by an all-human team. And yes, Miki, portrayed by Megumi Odaka, is actually part of it and harbor a ferocious fighting spirit. Now the overall gameplay and controls might seem incoherent and confusing at first, but if you can, just bear with me for a moment or two. At the beginning of each new mission, we're given a briefing of what's to be expected. Throughout the course of each journey, Godzilla is represented by a blue dot on the map display on the bottom half of the screen, whereas Godzilla, moving at his usual approximate craps pace, on the top screen is for the sake of visual attraction. Every time Godzilla gets near a building, utility pole, and or a hill, he crushes it to nothing, as we'd expect. Only exception is that it drains a diminutive yet dramatic extent of his energy. Whenever he gets near any random military unit and or trap, that also depletes his energy, except for the tanks when he crushes them. As for the blue and yellow square icons, they recharge his energy and provide him with hints and or a special power-up item to use in battle later, respectively. Whatever you do, don't lead Godzilla into any unwarranted off-limits areas, like edges of the battle area, or cables surrounding various utility poles, or rely on that useless time stop item. Upon engaging a boss monster, represented by the pink dot on the map display, of course, in battle, there's an all-new system in which both Godzilla and the enemy monster's fighting spirit meters randomly raise and or lower depending on their actions. The vital strategy in this is as follows, he has to get Godzilla to land a close-up blow on his target and then send him back and or forth in order to unleash one of three different offensive tactics, a headbutt, a tail whip, and the usual icing on the cake signature atomic breath, demonstrated via alternate cinematic cutscenes. The bottom line is, you have to be deliberate in every tactic you plan out, otherwise your enemy will flat out go to town on your ass like Rick Darris and Coey London going to town on Alyssa Jones aka Finger Cuffs. At the end of each mission, you get awarded with additional experience points, which allows Godzilla to evolve later, as well as an additional cutscene to further build upon the central plot. Speaking in the presence of undeniable truth, 
The overall controls and strategy might be perplexing to begin with, but after at least 5 test plays, they should all be freaking duck soup. In the first 2-3 missions, that is. But if I were you, I wouldn't so much as expect any grace periods throughout the course of the game, oh hell no. Now getting to the challenge, throughout each mission, most of the battle areas are filled with unexpected traps left and right. In terms of bosses, each and every enemy has their own complex yet straightforward strategy when it comes to confronting them. Like take Mecha Godzilla for example with his force field whenever Godzilla fires off a weak atomic breath volley. Biolante's invulnerability to Godzilla's headbutts, even after taking out her two front feelers. And Batra's vulnerability to Godzilla's super powerful atomic breath. And don't even get me started on the final boss, Bagan. Seriously, he makes Toka and Razor from Turtles 2 look like fucking Milo and Otis. Should Godzilla get his overgrown reptilian ass wasted? You only get three continues, so I'd use them wisely if I were you. The graphics are pleasing to the eye, even for a 16-bit Godzilla game. The presentation is rich in detail, down to the national landmarks, no less. It's not just the monster and UFO sprites and special effects, as well as the human portraits. The backgrounds for most of the stages are very faithful to the films. By today's standards, most of the other elements, like the map display and the cinematic anime-style attack cutscenes during battle, aren't really anything mind-blowing, but are all very diverse nonetheless. Harboring the same ominous musical energy of most of Akira Ifukube's original film scores, the overall compositions keep every G-Fan coming back for more. As for the sound effects, they can be unnerving at times, like Godzilla's trademark roar for example, but it's all gravy to the last, that's for sure. Considering that this game's not for everyone, Super Godzilla holds a special place within the hearts of most G-Fans and retro gamers alike the world over, yours truly included. As he or she figures out the aforementioned tricky-ass boss strategies and the battle area layouts, it tends to bore and or frustrate the living bejesus out of the player after quite some time, and that's understandable, I suppose. However, it should definitely raise his or her confidence level beyond belief over time to tackle the game yet again, 